And fire. Yeah, really, they are convicts. They are given some old Kalush slime for a K like that. They wear our uniforms, undress. The enemy knows that the Aider Battalion is... Some enemies, when the Aider Battalion storms a position, simply shoot themselves in the head. It's hard to realize that your land is being dismantled for parts, especially since I knew it before the war, and I see what is happening now. Donbass is essentially beautiful places, beautiful cities, beautiful history. And they are gathering there, and it's slap, slap, slap. And somehow it hit so hard that everyone thought that Heimers was hitting. You know, ours. Ours. They were like FK Heimers hitting there. I said it was me, and no one believed me, you know. And when I first looked bang, and the leg flew to the side. Shaikin artillery battery commander, our task is to prevent the enemy infantry from reaching our infantry as much as possible. The last time we flew there, there were 30 corpses lying around. Was it during the last assault? Yes, those are the ones who did not make it, those who definitely did not make it, but there are also those who escaped, many escaped. So, you took up positions, they took up a position, the enemy kind of withdrew, fled, and then they were chased to leave, and they just did not manage to. Well, they started bringing up reserves, moving in our direction, and the guys cut them off so that they would not harm us. The guys had a smoke in the trenches, collected their trophies, sat down, and that was it, goodbye. So you did not take anything during the time you were here in the back mid sector? No, of course not. Tell us about it. What do they have? They are homeless. They have nothing to take from them. Really? Yeah. Damn, they're convicts. They are given some old Kalush slang for Soviet automatic rifles, like that. They wear our uniforms, undress. Yes, they do. They don't have. I have a video. If they're... Do we have any video? There's something. In general, they are wearing iron helmets, that is, they are wearing Soviet helmets that were used in World War II. The guy who was pretending to be dead was lying there. Was lying. We found him, yes. Um, logic. Yeah, logic. We found logic. There was some crap in Vulgar. Relieved the enemy aircraft worked on a scheduled morning, lunch, and evening. It was difficult to shoot them down because they flew in from far away working. It also happened that they hovered over hours. And we knew roughly where they were coming from, where they were going. So we determined where it was. We have shells with remote fuses. They are designed to explode in the air. We have roughly adjusted where they will fly. When they say helicopters are flying, we are like whoosh, and already had everything prepared. No rush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's flying, go ahead, fire. And well, not right next to the helicopter, of course, because that would have been a filigree job. But somewhere near. The infantry said in 200 meters, but I don't believe it, of course, because the infantry always exaggerate. Well, even if it went off about a kilometer away, they saw an explosion in the air in front of them, thought they were being targeted by air defense, and then they turned around and, and we were just repelling air strikes like that, that is, helicopters flying, an explosion in front of them. And that's it, they flew back. During this entire period of the big war, did you learn to quickly integrate the newly mobilized? <laughs> <laughs> well, Iker says he's been here a month and he's already like at home. Fira, chief sergeant of an assault company, this is the history of Ader. It has always been like this here, since 2014. Whoever comes here, it's a big, big family. There is no such thing as someone who takes longer to join the team or someone who is faster. He comes and he is ours. We are his and he is ours. It's a big family. If there's task, it has to be accomplished. How is the enemy behaving in your areas now? The enemy is behaving aggressively. It does not want to give up its positions. 
There are heavy battles going on. We have to fight for every meter of our land. No one is retreating from their side. As I understand it, now in the back mid direction. Before it was mostly Wagner, and now there is a mix with regular Russian troops. They have been mixed, really. There are units of the Russian army and Wagner. Are they more combat ready or less so in this form? How did this affect them? I cannot answer this question, how they work and whether it helps them. Uh. There is heavy resistance. Do you feel that the offensive on the backbit direction has stopped it? Or is it still going on strongly on the part of the Russian army? There are no changes. Akhmet has been a hot spot for a long time, and it continues to be. An assault battalion is still probably the most difficult thing that is happening in the war. Have you ever had such a thing here among your team, that someone morally could not stand it? Let me put it this way. It is always hard for everyone. But a brotherly shoulder, support. A lot depends on it. If you feel that there is a shoulder next to you that will support you, then you go and fulfill your task. You were wounded, you told us, right? Yes, and more than once. It happened. Why do you come back? Because this is my land. This is our land, and we cannot do otherwise. I can't. I probably feel that way, and I think other people who are here have the same motivation. Basically, if you had the opportunity to resign from the army, would you still not resign until the war is over? The war will end. God forbid I will be alive. Then I will quit. Not yet. As long as I have the strength, as long as I am walking, as long as I am in the ranks, I will fulfill the tasks that will be assigned to me and defend my country. I cannot put this feeling into words because it is indescribable. Only people from Donbas can understand what is going on inside, what are the feelings and... It is hard to understand that your land is being dismantled for parts. Moreover, I knew it before the war. And I see what is happening now. Donbas is essentially beautiful places, beautiful cities, beautiful history. And now it has all been destroyed and continues to be destroyed. It is almost impossible to restore what is there, what was there. There will be new things, but what was there will not be. Subscribe to the channel and click on the bell so you don't miss a new video. We heard Deputy Company Commander for technical support when the guys arrive after the assault. When everyone is alive, it is a great happiness. Because those who are on assault operations, not on assault operations, we are all a team and everything works like a machine. If there's a single cog out of place, it's a failure. And we all worry when the guys arrive, the first phrase is all alive. Uh, the second phrase is there 300 is military slang for wounded. Yes. Are there any heavy ones? No. Yes. And few. Instant relief. Yes, it is because when you go out in the morning to form up and see that everyone is in place, it's cool. It's a balm for the soul. Okay. Do you have any rituals that you perform as a company before an assault? Of course. Tell us. We have a shamanic tambourine. I'm just kidding. Well, I think maybe if someone is religious, maybe they pray, you know. I'll tell you this. Everyone prays, of course. Everyone believes in God, and without God's help, we would not have overcome anything. But everyone has their own way of preparing for the battle. And how well we have greetings. We came out, greeted each other, hugged each other, and said, hello, it's our ritual. We looked into each other's eyes, made a joke and went with a smile and a good mood. No one withdraw into themselves. Everyone is positive. We need a little bit of humor here. Humor. It's true. Without humor, we would. It could be that people take our jokes wrongly, but it's hard here without humor. I also say the strength that gives us the most is the families who are there and wait for us.
A phone call, a smile from our daughter, warm words from life, this is what motivates us, what gives us strength. You can do a lot and you will do a lot. What you will receive here will strengthen you. This is the beginning, that is the end. Do exactly what I instructed to do. Develop, change the pace, and we will change. In 30 to 40 minutes, the groups will be swapped. Do you understand? That's it, get to work. A few days ago, you launched a successful assault, captured the Russian positions, and now, just a day later, your soldiers are training. Do you give them any rest at all? Alexander Kovalenko, assault company commander, if we give each soldier a lot of time to rest, we will not achieve anything. And we will not learn anything new, nor will we study and analyze the mistakes that were made during the battle. We have time that we won over the enemy, we defeated the enemy, and we won time that we can efficiently use for our unit, for our company. To analyze all this and prevent these mistakes in the future and fight the enemy even better. So your stormtroopers are constantly training. Yes, they do. We are constantly studying, constantly learning something new, constantly analyzing. We work very hard and smart. Because if every soldier is constantly analyzing, victory will be much closer than it seems. You have such a mix here in your company now. There are those who have been with you longer. There are newly mobilized. How does this interaction take place? How do different groups perform? Basically, well, I want to say there is no such thing as a bad fighter. All people come, even people who have not held a weapon in their hands. Judging by 2014, when we came to the war that began, and I would like to know that it has been going on since 2014 until now, but the active phase began on February 24, 2022. And the people who come, they know how to fight, they know how to defend their country. The only thing we do is to make adjustments, and we try to focus on the newcomers, train them in a short period of time, give them the most necessary things, after which they will be able to effectively perform a particular task. We have bricks, cover it with some stuff. Get something to match the color of the bricks. Cover that door over there on top, right there. Look, yeah, that's where you lay down with the door on top of you. That's it. You've got to fool the enemy all the time. How much time is needed? Five little ones. Five little ones. Противника надо постоянно дурить. Сколько время надо? Пять маленьких. Пять маленьких. We can say March was a successful month for the Aider Italian, right? Did you manage to win back several positions? I want to say that not only March was successful for the Aider Battalion, we are constantly training and rebuffing the enemy. The enemy knows what the Aider Battalion is. They know where we come out. And even during the assault, when Aider enters a particular enemy position, some enemies simply shoot themselves in the head. And Aider is helping other units hold the road to backbed right. Well, yes, look, the battalion's specific task is to hold the road of life to the town of Bakhmut. But in addition to this, the battalion constantly receives different tasks, both for work in Bakhmut itself and on the outskirts, and the road of life. But the main task is the road of life. Can you tell us about the latest successful assaults? The last successful assault was when we came out as a mixed group as they say, a hodgepodge. It was the 5th Detached Assault Regiment and the 8th. Two tanks came out, worked off, and then the boxes armed the air small carriers and 113, which were provided to us by our friendly countries, drove out, deployed into the tree line, the infantry dispersed and eliminated all the enemies. Those who did not want to surrender were eliminated. The enemy created barrier squads, which fired on those who tried to run away. But the 
barrier your troops were destroyed because the number of enemy who escaped outnumbered the number of barrier squads. This was all visible to the unmanned aerial vehicles that were observing this picture. The enemy often pretends to be dead when running. They fall down and lie down, but then start moving and peeking. As to say, it's not nice to peek, but if we catch up with them, we destroy them, this is our land. And we will further persecute and destroy everyone who comes to our land and imposes their rules. No, no, it's not the case. Anyway, someone is left to cover, that's for sure. Damn it, motherfucker. Go back to the slabs there. Go back and fall through. Without backup, you would have been killed. I had an unused weapon. Fuck, that was my big mistake. I moved at the speed of light. Did you shoot me or Chris? Fuck. No, probably Chris did. I was sitting in the pit over there. Like this video and share it with your friends. Red. Yes. Yeah. Oh. An alert. How far is it able to fly? Aviator senior of the air reconnaissance group in civilian life. It can fly very far, even 15 kilometers. When we were flying near Vaholder, there were missions in which we flew 10 kilometers with the Mavic 3. Near Bakhmut, as I said, the enemy's electronic warfare systems are very strong. That's why flying even at 2 kilometers is kind of feat. 2 to 3 kilometers is the extreme limit you could fly. Because all possible means of electronic warfare were brought here. What is the average lifespan of a drone near Bakhmut? It is not the same in every part of Bakhmut. The action of the electronic warfare is very uneven. We were on different rotations in different parts of Bakhmut. And in some places we flew for a very long time. We were able to not lose a drone for weeks. Not for a month, but for two weeks we could fly. And there are some areas also near Bakhmut where you can lose ten drones in five days. How does Russian aerial reconnaissance work. Well, I haven't been there, I don't know. I think it's not that bad there either, but they probably don't have Starlinks. And I don't think they have streams. But what we do know, for example, from their Wagner assault groups, they have a person in each group who carries five Mavic 3 drones. They also have a lot of them, and they have a group and a person behind them, a pilot, who leads this group. This pilot is usually with the commander or the squad. The commander looks at the panel and sees where his group is going. If they are professionals, they don't move without a drone either. They always launch the drone in front of them and check it out. That's why there are so many drones, both ours and theirs. This is also a big problem, because when a drone is hovering over friendly units, it's very difficult to understand whose drone it is. It's hard to know whether it's our drone or an enemy drone, and that's why there are cases when drones are shot down. Well, everyone is trying to shoot down the drone. Moldovan, Genu, you're inserting it the wrong way. <laughs> Not that side, this side. Deputy for the non-entity, or like this. Do you experience shell hunger, or do you have enough shells? Honestly, everything is learned by comparison. 
If we compare the first days of the war, we were shooting so much that the barrels were getting hot. We were shooting about 300 shells a day. There was a very high consumption of ammunition then, but now it is much less. It's not enough, especially for me. I'm the type of person who would probably stay out and shoot forever if there were enough ammunition. But you have to decide now. If you see one, for example, you don't shoot at him because you'll spend three shells on him. And he may hide somewhere else or something. If you see a group of people glory to Ukraine, welcome, there's a parcel for you, a gesture of goodwill. Do you shoot at infantry most often? In general, yes. Wagner's group has the most common symbol infantry running around the tree lines, and they have a lot of automatic machine guns to help them. More often we see them on foot. This is a big plus for them. Of course, people get tired, but as I understood, they consider people as expendable, they don't worry much about them. When our boys were storming and they were retreating, they gave the command to put a machine gun and shoot everyone who was running away. Our guys heard this on the radio station, personally. So you are a professional military? Yes, I graduated from the academy in 2018. I served in the 43rd Separate Artillery Brigade of Artillery, which was high-powered. We worked with Payan's Soviet self-propelled gun. Unfortunately, I found it in a bad state, and I had many scandals with the command. Imagine, you come as a young lieutenant and think you're going to raise the army up. And then you witnessed, as they say, army marinism, when soldiers' heads were smashed for not opening the gate for the commander. Commanders treat their personnel with disrespect, they don't consider them as human beings and don't provide them with proper combat training. I watched as fuel was stolen, vehicles that did not even have engines were decommissioned, but according to the documents they were supposed to be driving. It was very unpleasant to see such shit happening. Then my comrade got to Ader, so I decided to go to Ader as well. Where were you on February 24? Let's just say that we met it even earlier. February 24 was an important, serious day, but the artillery started shooting as already on the 16th or 18th. On the 18th, they were already shooting as in full force. Where were you at that time? We were in Granite and Donetsk region, and artillery battles started even then. I even have a video of how on the 23rd they were already shooting me with grad multiple rocket launcher systems. They had commander with the call sign red. And we tried to shoot at him. They were already traveling in a convoy, and we realized that serious preparations were underway. We started shooting at him. He shit himself, could not hold back, and called Brad. Brad hit us for the first time, and I have a video of it. We ran into the dugout and started laughing. Those were the first emotions. Then we come out, see that everything is in smoke. And I say in the video, load again. We shoot at them again with and grads hit us again. So we decided not to take any more risks. On the 23rd, we left, took a break, because we had been fighting for about a week. We were a little tired, so we rested, washed up, and so on. And in the morning, we were woken up, very tired, and told that the war had started. So we left. I understood that there would be a war, but I thought it would be like with the clear and I honestly did not expect a full-scale invasion. We were doing fine, shooting, and so on. But what shocked me the most was when the guys said that hellos were flying. Psychologically, it was very hard at first. 
И самые такие, чтобы поверх меня в шок, это когда пацаны сказали, типа, вертушки летят. Aviation, all that, it was really a full-scale war. And we have nothing to counter them with. Here, tanks are already following you. Oh, yes. I remember when they sent us the coordinates. We are checking them, and don't interrupt me. The tanks were coming, and for the first three days, the sound of artillery was unceasing. It seemed like grads were firing endlessly. We could hear the sound of explosions all along the front line. It was nothing like it is now. Now it's quiet, and something hits once a minute. Back then there were constant explosions, constant sounds, somewhere. Of course, it was hard psychologically, but I was more worried about my people, and you worry more about them because you understand, realize that their lives depend on your decisions. So, and thank God, I managed to keep everyone alive back then. Of course, there were some people who could not stand it psychologically and ran away. One smart guy ran away to Mariupol. To Mariupol. Didn't he come back? Frankly, I don't know what happened to him. To be honest, I have absolutely no respect for deserters. I think that they are cowards with whom you just can't deal in the future. People who went abroad and hid there from mobilization. You know, it's a problem of our country. It affects everyone. I understand that psychologically it is difficult to take up weapons and go to combat. But you can be some kind of engineer, do your stuff, help repair the vehicles, work on supplies. War is not only about taking the gun and shooting. Someone is doing psychological pressure on the enemy, science. Someone is working behind enemy lines, like the famous partisans in Kherson region. Some volunteers are just helping to deliver food. Everyone does what they can and what they think they can, but running abroad and saying this is not my war, it's a war of politicians and so on. In my case, I'm not fighting for politics and submitting abstract. I'm fighting for the guys who are with me right here. For the assault troops, my task is them to stay alive, and all my lads. This means to command and train people properly. And I don't care what somebody said back there, I don't care. To be honest, sometimes I have this very serious thought that when the war is over, I want to leave the country so that I don't have to see the faces of those superheroes who will come back later and say it was not me who sent you there. And those tough guys that were fighting somewhere. They weren't here when we needed them. Darn, that's why I think I'll be living somewhere in Spain on the coast. And that's it. I'll call you in the evening. This is the next one. For the target 221, count... Well, watch it. Zero one twenty six. Do it. It does. Tell me. Two hundred ninety seven. Two hundred ninety seven ninety six. Come on. When red. Firing at. Loaded. Cannon. Fire. Mask. Mask. Barney. Artillery platoon commander. We detected enemy infantry groups. Work on them. Though we had no fire adjustment. But we think we hit the targets. Can you tell us where it was? It's somewhere in the area between Ivanovsk and Klishchivka. There is a forest strip there, if I can say so. Approximately 600 meters long, and Russian soldiers move inside this forest strip. Is the density of fire high here? Yes. Patient senior battery officer, but we can say that today is quite calm. It's getting dark. Now, after a while, there will be a big disco. It's somewhere near. Yes. Cluster munitions. Wagon, Gred, artillery. Arctic gunner, artillery is power. 
Serious one. What did you do before mobilization? I did a lot of things, but in general, I was a school psychologist. A school psychologist. Can you imagine? Seriously? Yes. And look at this. Arctic Prominent Children's Center Summer Camp. Five years there. Did you work in Arctic? Yes, for five years. I lived and worked there. Oh, wow. Do the kids from your school know that you're on the front lines? Yes, of course. Do they write you anything? Yeah, they do. And what exactly? Well, glory to Ukraine, we are proud, and so on. Before I joined the army, I worked at school. Before that, I worked as a psychologist at my school when I attended as a kid at home. And when the invasion started, the very first days, those boys, 10th and 11th grade, they were first to join the army. So I could not do nothing. I went to the military commissariat, and here we go. In that way. And your school, where is it? Not far from here. The next region, Pokrovs, district, village of Mykolivka. Oh, so many people from Pokrovs and district in this unit. Yes, yes. we know no fear. In that way. Are are you from Pakros, from these lands? Yes. How did you end up in Ader? In Ader. Well, I signed a contract in 2020. Me and my friend planned to join the 54th Separate Mechanized Brigade, but then there was the coronavirus and all the paperwork stopped. And only a Ader was recruiting, so we decided to go there. Why not? Initially, we wanted to join the artillery, and we ended up in the artillery. Before that, you were a minor. I am a miner. Yes, I work. Formerly, I'm still working in the mine while I serve in the army. So what made you want to join the army? What attracted me to the army? Sure, I don't even know. Maybe some kind of diversity at first, I guess. I just got tired. I just got tired of living in a mine, because I'm working, roughly speaking, in the management sphere. I have a relevant university degree. Hence, I worked as, a, as an assistant of the head section engineer, deputy head section engineer. So I had to, if you can say so, live in the mine and nearby. So I got a little... F King fed up with that, let's say so, so I decided to join the army, and it worked out pretty well, until the 24th of February 2022. But then I realized that even if I had not served in the army, I would have joined anyway, because this is my homeland, and I don't want that it to happen with my hometown, what is happening with Bakhmut, what happened with Mariupol, what happened to Severodonetsk. Well, you can draw a long list of cities that have been destroyed and are being destroyed now. And no one else will stop it but us. That's it. Aider God with us. And those who joined you after the full scale invasion, did you have to drill them additionally? Were they well prepared? They had zero knowledge. We drilled them at the spot, showed them weapon, assembly and disassembly. What it means to be a gunner. Talk them every starting from zero knowledge. And now they work pretty professionally. So you were near Vavolder and unexperienced recruits were sent to you. Near Vavolder, yes. There were recruits, not that many of them. They were sent to us, yes. These guys outdoors were mobilized too, joined the unit, and became the aerial reconnaissance team. Crocker, deputy commander, the main thing is that they're eager, they have motivation, they want to learn. Recently, two friends joined our unit, they've never been to army before. They were all the time together, worked together, lived in the same block. <clears throat> they told us we know nothing, but we're eager about a week on combat missions, and they're working pretty well. It depends only on the motivation. For instance, me. I'm a psychologist. I did not know a shit. I mean military stuff. I came to Borisik Chechen. He once even asked me how many tanks make the tank company. And I say probably eight or ten. So we had to talk about this. And it's 10 tanks. He did analyze this and said this and that way. A lot of people immediately after the full-scale invasion were interested in the thing, how did this happen? 
Но кто вот на начале войны вот I'm not made for war. No one is made for war. Do people get exhausted after a year of fighting? They get exhausted after two months. In average, in NATO countries, mostly this is referring to special forces. But the Americans have this digit too. If I'm not mistaken, it's 48 days in combat zone. And after they try to move the unit out, at least for a week, it can be enough to the safe place where you can walk in slippers, have a proper shower, watch television, talk to your family. The unit gets rotation 48 days after that it's burnout. So uh, the main thing in all that is systematization. If a person knows well, I'm gonna work hard and be perfect now. And then I'll get the sugar. So the person works good further and does not concentrate on bullshit. It is clear that because of the war, the military has very large problems with their families because you burn out. You don't want to tell, and sometimes you don't want to speak at all. I mean, even it happened to me. I lost my family, basically, because of the fact that I was constantly in the service. In the war, I did not have the time for my family. Are you divorced? We are in the process. Uh, sadly, it happened, so mostly the problem was in me. The normal people go to work, come home in the evening, hug their loved ones, kiss their kids in the forehead, spend their time together in the military. We can be deployed for eight months, sometimes even a year. Then we go to the training grounds, we don't have a base somewhere. So I saw my wife at best one month a year. Who can put up with that for five years? I think no one. And she realizes that she hasn't that much support. She has to go to the shop herself. She has to carry those heavy bags herself. Pregnant all herself. Not that much support. Even just morally. I can't support her that much because I burn out at my job. I don't feel like discussing anything at all. And that's the problem for most of the career military. Many people get divorced because of that kind of problems. How do you support yourself now? I don't know. Somehow you try to distract yourself from all this by doing some work. When you're doing something, you don't think about any problems. When you have time to just sit and think, then you can get deep into that. So badly, it eats you from within. Yes, some military experience swift changes of mood. Now I'm smiling, everything cool. Five minutes later, sad and depressed. And even don't know what to do. I don't know what will be after the war, but I think it will be hard to cure. Maybe some therapy can do something, but it's impossible to cure. Sure. And it will be a big problem with all those people who have seen the horrors of war. As for me, I don't know how can you be happy. Even after the war, when you've seen death killings, destruction, even just traveling, even seeing something beautiful when you know that something like war exists, that's why a lot of people will never feel the joy and pleasure from that banal and simple things. Now they, but on the war, you feel yourself different. Emotions are more sincere. People are more sincere with each other, take care of each other. It's all for real. And when the war will be over, we will get back to the mode, the hypocrisy of people, and no one will care about you. Journalist Diana Busco. Camera and editing Dmitro Hunter. Editor Alexander Nazarov. Driver Iher Andreyushchenko. Producer Kostya Nekiparenko.